Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Uh, and I just wanted to thank our, our organizers. Um, this is actually my first time to South America, so it's a huge honor to be invited and to have the chance to speak before you all. Um, are the slides doing a moment? How's everyone doing? Ready for the coffee break? <laughs> uh, this is also going to be a pretty code-heavy slide, so or code-heavy talk, so strap yourselves in. Um, yeah. So my talk is called Elevated Swift, uh, and obviously because it's called that, we're going to be talking about Swift. Wrong. We're going to be talking about elevators. If you thought this talk was about Swift, you are mistaken. This talk is about elevators. Uh, I am absolutely obsessed with elevators. I don't know why. I've always been obsessed with elevators. Uh, I get to an elevator bay, I push the button, and I wonder what happens when you push the button. Who makes the elevators that come when you push the button? How do we know that the elevator is safe? How do you know which elevator is going to come for you? Do the computers decide? Are all elevators run by computers? If the elevator is full, does it stop for ex extra people or does it keep going without stopping? How do we test the algorithms for elevators? How do you make sure the elevator is where it needs to be before the person pushes the button? How does a residential elevator differ from a commercial elevator? How do super tall buildings manage elevators? So I'm just, every time I press the button, I think about all this stuff. And um, this is a tweet, this is 2014. Billions of dollars a year of productivity are lost because programmers are thinking about elevators all the time. So maybe it's just me, I don't know. But as far as I can tell, uh, with an N of one, all programmers think about elevators all the time. So um, I'm not kidding, this is really a talk about elevators. We're gonna talk about the history a little bit. Um, this guy, Elisha Otis, he made the first safety elevator. And before him, we had a way of, of moving an object from one floor to another floor, but if the rope snapped, the objects would fall, and if there was anybody in there, they would die. So in New York in 1952, this guy made an elevator, and he went up in the elevator, and he used an ax, and he cut the rope, and in front of everybody, the elevator dropped a little bit and then locked into place. Uh, I've done demos on stage before. I don't think I have any demos that I trust enough to like go up in an elevator and try not to die. So this guy makes the first elevator in 1852. Uh, he patents it. In 1853, the next year, we get the first elevator shaft, so the hole in which the elevator goes. So there's no elevator that's ready yet, but this guy, Peter Cooper, he builds an elevator in his new building. So this is one year later. This elevator is round. It's not square, because he didn't know what elevators were gonna look like, so he just assumed they were gonna be round. So he builds this round elevator shaft, and you can see it going through the whole building. And a few years later, when elevators hit the market, um, they put an elevator inside the shaft, but it was a square elevator in a round shaft. Uh, and then about 100 years later, in the 1970s, they uh, remodeled this building and refurbished it, and now there's a custom round elevator that fits into the round elevator shaft. So this is the first elevator shaft. The first elevator doesn't come until four years later, uh, also in New York, in Soho, this is a building, the yeah, building is actually still there today. And uh, this is the first building with the first, uh, that has an elevator in it. Um, the control of the elevator is a crucial part of it. Before we had computers, before we had any technology, we had um, elevator operators. And this was a person who stands in the elevator. And when you want to go up, they sort of push this way. And when they want to go down, they push this way. So you get into the elevator and you tell him, I want to go to the fifth floor. And he takes you up. And the skill of the elevator operator is to get the floor and the elevator to line up perfectly. Because there's a technology we call automatic floor leveling. This technology did not exist. So it was really just how much skill the elevator operator had to bring you right exactly to the floor. Uh, after a while, they invented scheduled elevators. So this was like a bus. Um, you wait for the three o'clock bus to the or to elevator to the tenth floor, and then you go from there. But this is really inefficient because sometimes it's running empty, sometimes it's just sitting there. So nobody liked this. This was no good. Uh, eventually, in the mid 1940s, we started to get real automatic elevators that work like the elevators you know today, uh, and these are made with relays. So a relay is kind of like a transistor, but really big, and you can encode the whole algorithm. So you see the algorithm here. And this controls, I think, a four-floor elevator and, um, and basically does everything you would want it to do. The only problem is that it's huge. 
And so, of course, in the 1970s, the microprocessor revolution comes, and we're able to put all of that logic um, into a simple circuit board and uh, go from there. One other thing I want to add about these relays, the algorithm is encoded into the hardware. So if you want to change the algorithm, you have to change the hardware. You literally physically have to go and move pieces and reconnect them in order to change how the elevator works. Of course, with software and microprocessors, these are, this all happens remotely. The elevator can be connected to the internet, and, and its software can be uh, updated uh, like that. Um, one more thing I want to touch on before we move to the algorithms. This is an elevator testing tower. This one is in Japan. Uh, it's an in, in an industrial area, and so you can see there's nothing around it. It's just this huge tower in the middle of nowhere, and it's 173 meters tall. This is another testing tower. This one's 248 meters tall, and it's just in you know an industrial part of China. This is a ThyssenKrupp elevator tower, and so this is where they test it. So this tower has, I think, eight or 12 elevators in it, and they just run all day long testing different algorithms, and that's what we want to talk about. So let's talk about some algorithms. Um, if you want to learn more about this, there's this book, The Elevator Traffic Handbook. It's pretty dry. If you're into elevators like me, you might want to read it, but there's some really boring parts. Um, but a lot of the algorithms and ideas that we're going to talk about here come from this book. So this book is really good. It was made in uh, 2002, so it's pretty new. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time coding uh, an elevator algorithm in Swift. And so to do that, we're going to start with the most basic elevator algorithm. This is how everybody expects an elevator to work. This algorithm was popularized by Donald Knuth in The Art of Computer Programming, which was his seminal book. And uh, it's pretty simple. You keep going in the direction you're going as long as there's people in your direction who want to go with you. And the only time you stop is if somebody wants to get off or somebody wants to get on and they're going in your direction. So this is the algorithm that we're going to be encoding um, for our elevator. Uh, we're going to dive into some code here. We're going to start simple. We're going to build up pieces, and then we're going to get to the full algorithm. So the first thing we need is a really basic enum, the direction. Are we going up or are we going down? Okay? It gets more complicated than this, I promise. So um, in addition to this, I'm going to have a little helper here that's just a quick initializer. So if I give it a from floor and a to floor, it'll be able to tell you what direction that is. So if from is less than two, then we're going up, and otherwise, we're going down. Um, direction needs some helpers. One is a multiplier. So this is just going to be a number that tells us, are we going up or down? Up is going to be positive. Down is going to be negative. Again, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then the last helper we need is we just want a quick way to be able to flip the direction. So if you're up, you're going to go down. If you're going down, you're going to go up. Simple. So the next thing we need to talk about, we've got our direction sorted is the concept of a call. So when you call an elevator, it comes to you. There's two types of calls. One type is a hall call. And so this is when you're standing on the floor and you push the up button or the down button, and the elevator comes to you and picks you up. Then once you get into the elevator, then you have a car call. And a car call goes to a specific floor. So you say, I want to go to the 26th floor. And so these are the two types of calls. So we're going to use this in our model. Um, the call model is pretty straightforward. It's got a kind, which again is hall or car. Hall or car. Um, and there's a floor that you're coming from and a floor that you're going to. So this kind of represents one passenger. Um, again, some helpers. One is what direction is the call going in. We're going to use the initializer we made on the previous slide. Um, the next one is the destination. Now, you would think the destination is just the two field, but this is the destination from the perspective of the elevator. So if you're doing a hall call, the destination for the elevator is where it's going to pick you up, which is the from field. And when you're in the elevator and you have a car call, then the destination is where you're going to. So this is, remember, this destination is for the elevator, not for the passenger. Uh, and then the last thing we need to do is just a little tiny helper that helps us um, kind of have a nice way to say the, the passenger is now going from the hall into the car. So if it's a hall call, turn it into a car call. So this is when you get on the elevator. Uh, and then with that, we're ready to start building up more and more pieces for our uh, elevator. This is what we're going to call a dispatcher. So this is going to control the elevator. And we're going to start with just one elevator. And so what does an elevator need to know? It needs to know how many floors it has. That doesn't change. It needs to know who's waiting for the elevator, who's waiting in the hall, and who's waiting in the car. It needs to know what direction it's going. And it needs to know what floor it's on. 
Um, quick initializer, nothing crazy here. Uh, everything else has a default except for the number of floors. And the way that we're going to model our, um, our algorithm is it's going to be a uh, kind of a, an event loop. Uh, if you might be familiar with like NS run loop, it's going to kind of work like that. As events happen, our elevator is going to react in real time to those events. So we're just going to spin off an asynchronous task, and we're going to spin a while loop forever, and we're going to just wait every once in a while. So this tick is just going to wait for like 16 milliseconds, so like 60 hertz. And every 60th of a second, it's going to check what it should do. So we'll build this loop function later, but this is where all of the guts of the algorithm are going to go. So um, more helpers. There's going to be so many helpers. Uh, OK, are we at a floor? So is at floor. So if, if the elevator is at the floor, then we can return true. So if the floor uh, is equal to the floor position, then true. That one's easy. Uh, here's where it gets juicy. Does the elevator have a call above the elevator? And so the way we do that is we check the whole queue, and we see, are there any destinations? Remember, that's from the elevator's perspective, where the uh, destination is above our current floor. And then similar for has calls below elevator, same thing, just flip the sign. And then uh, we also want to know if you have any calls in the current direction. So that's just going to make it easier for us to call. And so we know if we're going up, we need to check has calls above elevator. And if we're going down, has call below elevator. So this tells us if we're going in the right direction, if there's more stuff to see. Um, next one is let's talk about the people in the, in, the, in the elevator. So we've got our passengers, and that's just going to be everybody in the queue who has a car call. So those are our passengers. We're going to use that passengers um, property in this next one. Uh, a light, I don't know if everybody knows what this means. This is just a fancy British word that means to get off of an elevator or to get off of a bus or something like that. Um, so if you want to get off, we need to know if you're a passenger, which means do you have a car call, and are we at the floor of your destination? And if you are, then we need to let people off here. And um, the other thing we want to check is, is there anybody who wants to get on or get off at this location? All right, and that's going to be anybody in the queue who is at the right floor and is going in the, in the direction that we're going. So this is going to tell us if anybody wants to get on or get off. So with that, we can write a couple of uh, methods that will help us with our simulation. So this is a way to board passengers. Um, and to board the passengers, we need to look through the queue, and we need to get all the calls. Um, we need to find the people who are in the waiting in the hall. They're waiting at the floor that we're currently uh, at. And then we also need to make sure they're going in the direction that we're going. And if so, we can just mutate that item in the queue and say, OK, uh, you can go ahead and board the elevator. So that's going to convert you from a hall call to a car call. And then uh, I believe this is the last helper. This is to let passengers off. And again, we go through the queue. The, we're going through the queue backwards this time because we're going to be removing items. And so we don't want to mess up our indexes. So we're going to go backwards, grab the call. If it's a car call and we're at the right floor, then remove that person from the queue. They made it to their destination. So that is a success. And now we're ready to write the loop. So this is now we've built all the little pieces, and we're ready to build the elevator algorithm. So the first thing we check is, do we need to stop here? Uh, does anybody care that we're here? And so do we have any calls at the current location? So uh, if there's somebody waiting to get on or somebody waiting to get off, this is going to be true. We can open and close the doors. Uh, in the simulation, this just waits a little bit just to simulate the idea of opening a door. And then we want to let, let new people on and let people off when they're ready to go. So this just, if you're at a floor and there's somebody who wants to get on or off, let them do that. Um, and then we need to handle the motion. So if we're going in the right direction, so we have more calls in the current direction, then we're just going to kind of move a little bit in that direction. Uh, the point one just represents the speed of the simulation. Uh, if you made it bigger, it would go faster. This just looks kind of nice. And so it goes one-tenth of a floor every frame, basically. And we use our multiplier to decide if we're going up or down. And then if, the, if there's nobody in the current direction and the, there's still people in the queue, meaning the queue is not empty, then we got to turn around because uh, there's nobody above us and there's people below us and we want to keep going and pick up those people. And if there's nobody in the queue, then we don't have to do anything. We can just chill right where we are. Nobody wants us, so we can stay where we are. Uh, and that is basically the whole elevator algorithm. So I've actually connect, I've written this code. I've connected it to SwiftUI. And uh, I have a simulation that we can watch. And we can see the elevator al algorithm in action. So here it is. 
uh, it's picking people up and dropping people off, and you see it keeps going in the same direction until there's nobody else in that direction. Um, and I think, it's a, I think it's a very nice animation. People are getting off, people are getting on. Some people are riding skateboards, some people are shooting their bows and arrows, it's good. Um, but the question I wanna ask about this is, what kind of traffic is this in the elevator? And this is where things get really juicy. So this is what's called interfloor traffic. Um, interfloor traffic is just someone coming from a random floor and going to another random floor. And this is an important part of elevators, but if you look at the way that people use elevators, it doesn't actually end up being the majority of the usage. So um, in the book, Elevator Traffic Handbook, the authors show this graph. And so they show the typical usage of a commercial elevator um, during the course of a day. And there's two important parts here that elevator um, designers are interested in, the up peak and the down peak. So you can see in the morning, everybody gets to the building and they're all going up to their offices. Then there's a little bit of interfloor traffic. They go out for lunch, some of them go out for lunch, some of them come back from lunch. There's a little more interfloor traffic and then at the end of the day, there's a down peak. Oops, there's a down peak. And so these up peak and down peak modes are the, are the things we have to optimize for. Interfloor is easy because everybody's going in and out, but the up peak and down peak are really important for designing an elevator. So let's take a look at a simulation of up peak traffic. So here's the way this works is about 90% of people are generated on the lobby floor, and sometimes you'll see someone random like on the second floor there, uh, and they'll be, they'll be generated as well. And as you watch this elevator, it just picked up seven people, and it goes back down. Now it picked up eight people, and it's gonna keep picking up more and more people, and you realize nine people, we didn't build any limit for how many people our elevator can hold. So this elevator will pick up as many people as, as are waiting for it, and that's not very realistic. So let's go ahead and code a um, capacity for our elevator. Uh, capacity turns out to be pretty straightforward to add. Uh, it's just an instance variable for how many people. Uh, for our simulations, I'm gonna choose five people. Um, you set it up in the initializer, it never changes, and I added one more helper, because you know I love helpers, uh, and it's just, is there capacity in the elevator? Is there space in the elevator for more people? And so with that capacity, oh, there's actually one more thing we need, to, or two more things we need to check. One is, when people are getting on, is there space to let them on? So we just have to add a quick has capacity check when we're boarding passengers. And if there's no capacity, they're not gonna get on. And um, when we're stopping, we need to decide, uh, do we need to stop? And normally we just stop based on if somebody wants us there. But if we're full, we actually don't have to stop and we can get our passengers to their destination faster. And so there's actually two conditions. Sometimes people wanna get off. And if they wanna get off, we have to stop so that they can get off. But if there's nobody that wants to get off and there's no space, then we're not gonna stop. We're just gonna keep going. So that's pretty much it, and that lets us manage our capacity. So this is another up-peak simulation with capacity this time. And if you watch the bottom floor, we're doing good. Then we have a bunch of people, and not everybody can get on the elevator. And this number keeps going up and up and up, and we cannot keep up with this traffic. So this is a real problem. There's a couple of things you can do to fix this, um, but it, fundamentally this is a design problem with the building and we need to think about that. Before we move on to how to solve this, uh, I wanna look at down peak traffic as well. So I also wrote a down peak simulator. This is everybody's being generated on random floors and they're go all going down to the lobby. And what I want you to pay specific attention to is what happens on the bottom floors that are not the lobby. If you notice like the floor labeled one and two, people will be stacking up there but by the time the elevator gets to them, it's full. And so they keep adding up and they're in a very frustrating position because they're waiting for this elevator and every elevator that comes is full. So this is also a real problem. Um, again, there's solutions for this. You can, you can tell the elevator to go to different floors and pick up people. Um, but fundamentally, a simulation is in the design phase and maybe we can change the building. And the way we wanna change the building is to add an extra elevator because one elevator is not enough. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have multiple elevators, so we're gonna change our simulation to be able to support that. Um, this is a bit of a complex change, uh, but it ends up being very, very important. Uh, our original single elevator dispatch had all these properties. These four are properties of the elevator, and the, the first one, number of floors, is a property of the building, generally. And so we're gonna take these four properties and we're gonna move them into a new type called elevator, and then um, we're gonna rename to multi-elevator dispatcher, and we're going to store a bunch of elevators and we're gonna store our hall calls. So there's two things I wanna call out here that are really important. 
One is the calls are now separated. So the hall calls are all in the dispatcher. So the dispatcher knows who's waiting for the elevators on the floors, and the car calls have all moved into the elevator. So the elevator knows who's inside of it. Um, and then the other thing I want to call attention to is this. This is not the cleanest code I've ever written. It's a, it's a strongly typed reference to its parent. Probably this would be a delegate or a block or something, but it makes the code a lot easier if we just um, leave these two very tightly coupled. Um, and so with that, we can go on and change our algorithm. There's only a couple of small changes here. One is um, instead of looking at self.q, self.q doesn't exist anymore. We need to look at both the, we actually just need to look at the hall calls because we're picking people up. So we're just going to ask, and this is in the elevator, we're going to ask the dispatcher um, for our hall calls and use those to determine who needs to board. And then these all stay the same, but there's one more um, little thing, which is that the call needs to move out of the hall calls from the dispatcher and into the elevator. And so that's just managed by these arrays. Um, these helpers, they were using self.q before. That's not going to work. We need to look at the hall calls and the car calls. And so this is going to run on every elevator. And then uh, this is our loop. Our loop doesn't need to change at all. Because our helpers are written at such a high level, the loop stays exactly the same. Nothing changes. And so we can do a simulation with two elevators. And this is up peak traffic. And so you can see that these two elevators are actually very able to keep up with the amount of traffic that this building generates in the morning. So that is a win in my book. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, simulation there. Um, kind of wrapping up here, this game is really fun. This is called Elevator Saga. Uh, I personally have had a very tough time with it because you have to write the code in JavaScript, and I hate JavaScript. Uh, but it's really fun, and they give you these challenges like transport 15 people in 60 seconds, and you get to write the algorithm and test it out and see how it looks and how it works. So if you're interested in any of these topics, this is a very fun game to play. Um, and then I'm going to leave you with uh, a really big simulation of 10 elevators and lots of people being spawned uh, and say thank you for having me uh, here to talk to you. Okay, thank you, Sarush. Yes, uh, we have two questions yes, for you. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Fernando Goulart says, uh, first of all, congrats for the great talk. Thank you. Um, elevator algorithm seems to be the typical scenario for test driven development. What do you think about it? The typical scenario for uh, TDD. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh in, in writing, this is a good situation for using TDD. I think that that's true, uh, and I could have written this with TDD. Uh, when building it, but for me, um, the point of TDD is to have a tight loop where you make a change and then you're able to see the effects of your change really quickly. Um, for me, in this case, the simulation was a lot easier because I could see exactly what was happening when I ran it. So it's not exactly TDD, but making a change and then watching the algorithm to see how it behaves and getting a visual indication of if the elevator is working correctly was more valuable to me than TDD. Typically, something that is very logic heavy like this is a really good candidate for TDD. But, uh, and you can control the simulation very precisely, which is really good. But um, I chose not to do it for this one. But it's definitely a good idea. OK. Um, elevator question. Yes. <laughs> Does the closed doors button uh, really do anything in the algorithm? That's a good question. Uh, the answer is it depends on what country you're in. Um, in the United States, I know it doesn't do anything in almost every elevator. You also can't cancel an elevator in the United States, but other countries have different laws and they have different uh, general cultural practices. So like in Korea, you can cancel an elevator by either double-clicking the button or holding the button. And so, uh, Generally speaking, clicking the up button multiple times does nothing. It's not going to help you. The elevator can't really come any faster. OK. And we have uh, space for one more question. Yeah. Uh, Magno Cardona, who is it? Do you want to, do you want to ask it? OK, I'll do it. Um, have you added a weight problem to the elevator algorithm? So I simulated the weight problem by just assuming that every person weighs the exact same. Uh, obviously, that's not true in real life, and you need to consider your technical limitations of what's the steel I'm using, what's the cable I'm using, what's the floor made out of, and um, what's the building made out of to determine how many people, how much weight can fit. 
And then you need to figure out what's the average weight of your passengers and how that fluctuates based on the day. Maybe when people come back for lunch, you can put one fewer person in the elevator. Um, so I didn't use weight. You could use weight. Uh, but for me, it was simpler just to use a number of people. Yeah. Uh, find me during the coffee hour. I have lots of weird details about elevators that did not fit in the talk. There's all kinds of crazy details and sectoring and all kinds of weird stuff you can do. Uh, it's all in the book. I read the whole book. It's, yeah, there's a lot there. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have more questions on the app, but yes, uh, feel free to reach out to him. Yeah. And have a good uh, elevator talk. And let's uh, give him a big applause. All right, thank you so much.